Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, 5G Performance Monitoring, Using the Network Edge for Competitive Advantage, sponsored by Acedian. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resources widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask for your feedback. A survey will pop in on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day of the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heidi Reading's Principal Analyst, Gabriel Brown. Gabriel? Thank you, and hello, uh, everybody. Welcome once again to 5G Performance Monitoring using the Network Edge for Competitive Advantage. It's terrific to have you all with us. Uh, thank you for coming. We hope you find this session useful. We're going to be talking about uh, 5G, of course, today and specifically uh, around uh, three areas, uh, the network edge and edge cloud uh, in general, advanced service types perhaps delivered via network slices, uh, and then also the need for performance monitoring end-to-end -end at the service layer. Uh, I would explain as we go through why that's so important. One of the really exciting things about the 5G system is the potential to redesign and optimize business critical operating processes in many diverse industries, um, uh, lots of them you will have heard of. For customers, though, to, re to rely on this technology, they need service level agreements, SLAs, that can be mon monitored, reported, and maintained over the life cycle of the service or contract. And this is really fundamental to the uh, ability to address and serve advanced use cases with 5G. The kind of hit and hope or the best effort basis that would characterize uh, you know, a lot of broadband access today uh, on, on LTE or even, even wireline uh, isn't sufficient, uh, and it's why performance monitoring uh, and service insurance is so important. My name is Gabriel Brown. I'm a principal analyst with Heavy Reading, where I lead our mobile network coverage. I'm also your host and moderator for today. I'm joined by our expert guest speaker, Richard Piazantin, who is a Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer at Exceedian. Um, welcome, Richard. Uh, good to have you with us today. Could you um, perhaps say a few words about yourself uh, and your role there? Thank you very much, Gabriel. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you this morning. Uh, and again, uh, echoing your comments, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I hope you'll find uh, you'll find this uh, interesting. Uh, and if uh, and if not, uh, the definition of expert perhaps uh, entertaining at some level. Um, so my name is Richard Piazzantino. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Marketing Officer for CDN Networks, uh, headquartered in Canada. Um, been with the CDN for the last uh, for about a year now. Uh, previous to that, I was the general manager for the service enablement business at a company called Viavi. Um, spent last 23 years in the telecoms business, uh, and I will confess going into this webinar for our entire audience, I am by no uh, a neutral party uh, in this. I want our service provider customers to take their rightful place at the top of the stack, and uh, I want uh, I want to do everything in my power, my company's power, and this collective uh, wisdom of uh, of this group uh, to make that happen. So that'll I'll shed a little bit more light on that as we go through the webinar. Fantastic. Thanks, Richard. So in terms of agenda, I'm going to give a, a, a short intro on you know, what's happening in, in 5G across the industry, link that through to um, service and service assurance, performance monitoring, before handing over to Richard for, I guess, the, the bulk of the material. We have a poll question during Richard's uh, section. Also, we're very much uh, looking to uh, take audience Q&A, um, probably towards the end, but perhaps one or two places we go through. Um, Rich is very open to taking questions, um, has great knowledge both on the sort of te technical side and business side, so, so take advantage of that. Uh, you can submit questions at any time as you go uh, through uh, the event. There's a, a Q&A sort of dialogue box on your screen there. So just to start, uh, uh, introducing here what is basically a, a sort of a, a generic timeline for, for 5G deployment. 
we have now um, the first standards, really, of, I think at the uh, September drop, the first standards and the first office products uh, becoming available from, from quite a number of vendors on, on the network side. Operators can therefore start to plan with a, a, a reasonable degree of confidence for the actual deployment and extension of that over the coming years. We've seen already this year the, the, the pre-standard uh, demos by uh, the, um, the, the South Korean Winter Olympics. Verizon's launched its 5G home service on, on fixed wireless. And there's a ton going on elsewhere I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Um, what I also wanted to say is, you know, it's all very exciting right now, but we do need to keep uh, expectations, I think, in check a little bit, certainly for the, for the very near term. Um, my, my personal view is that despite the, the NR new radio acceleration we've had over, over the last uh, couple of years and the early drop for release 15 and so forth, uh, I still personally see the 2020 Olympics in uh, Tokyo, Summer Olympics there, as a, as a kind of a key way marker, a key sort of threshold to cross. I think this, this, correspond, well, this does correspond very well to the IMT 2020 process and uh, 3GPP uh, release 16. So I think that sort of was the original kind of uh, target, I guess, for the industry. Things got brought forward, but I still see it as, 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 as probably the, the best way marker uh, right now. Uh, we should have some degree of maturity and starting to see a little bit of scale coming into the technology at, at that point. Uh, I also wanted to say um, it's really important that the industry as a whole uh, keeps its eye on the prize in terms of uh, not just kind of extending uh, the, 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 the classic use cases we're, we're familiar with, but actually extending into new markets and so forth, uh, as we'll talk about. That is really um, the most exciting thing about uh, the, 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 the technology. So um, just a chart here, just showing some selected uh, uh, activity um, uh, around the world. Uh, the, 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 you know, there's, there's actually a, a quite a bit more than this, but across the three different regions, those uh, boxes in bright red are, are, are operators that have gone into a public uh, deployment sort of dates, and we have a little sense of, of, of what they're doing. Those also outlined in yellow are operators that have uh, already gone live. So obviously there's the Verizon example. Um, uh, and then out, outside, you know, uh, in the U.S., we're going expecting to see AT&T in 12 markets, more or less any day now. They're still committing to that in, in 2018. Uh, T-Mobile's talked about it. 600 Sprint has a has a great plan there in mid-band as well. So the U.S. is 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 very competitive and, and moving. Um, tons happening in Europe, um, in the U.K. as it happens. I'll talk about a, 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 an example there in a moment. Um, uh, Telia in Finland announced a sort of a, a kind of a commercial, pre-commercial launch just yesterday uh, where they have a system set up in uh, Helsinki Airport with sort of um, uh, 5G um, robot helpers roaming the, roaming the airport concourse, sending back video and, and all these different things. I call that really pre-commercial, but it, it's still, uh, in their mind, I think, is, is, a, is, is a launch of sorts. And then the big one probably really is we go to uh, South Korea, all three uh, operators launched uh, sort of quasi nationwide, really, in mid-band spectrum on Saturday, so just a few days ago, uh, and that probably, you know, is a is a mixture of sort of consumer smartphones and with a few enterprise customers as well. So that probably will go down as the sort of start of uh, mobile 5G, I should think, in in, in time. Anyway, tons going on. Um, another way to look at it, and I thought it's quite a decent way to, uh, a decent proxy for progress, is just to look at the what happened in UEs or user equipment devices, as, as normal people would call them. Um, you can see a pretty rapid pace of development in just three years. The example to the left there was from MWC 2015. Uh, the UE at that point you had to wheel around on a trolley. Well, let's push that to you now. Um, uh, the device on the right is a sort of prototype type of device that people are using for interoperability testing and field testing in quite a few different operators around the world. You can see we're getting close to a sort of generic sort of smartphone form factor. You could say we're more than 50% of the way there, perhaps 80%. And we'll see those devices in 2019. I'd caution again, however, perhaps only 10% of where we need to be in, in UE terms when you start thinking about modules for industrial IoT and all these other applications. I think there's a, a, a way to go. So um, in terms of network, uh, we're seeing similar uh, uh, rates of progress. It's just an example of a, a site, a set of sites set up in uh, London by EE, uh, which I had a drive test of uh, two weeks ago. Um, it's pretty interesting. I mean, it's, it's working very well. It's a 64T, 64R massive MIMO system. 
um, doing a gigabit uh, uh, downlink as you're driving along and handing over on the, on, uh, through the streets of the City of London in a bus. Um, basically, gigabit handover to mobile. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, it is a it is a, a very impressive feat. Um, kind of interesting though, I had the equivalent demo of LTE almost exactly nine years ago in Oslo, driving around in a, in a, in a minibus a testing network. There the test was to show 100 megabits per second downlink uh, with handover and so forth. And I have to say that at that time was uh, much more impressive than this most recent demo. Um, and I think we've become uh, a little bit blasé about you know, amazing mobile broadband performance, uh, perhaps because it kind of reflects, I know it's, uh, I don't want to sort of uh, talk it down too much, but it kind of reflects a, a little bit of sort of business as usual type of model. You have a you know have a smartphone, you make some uh, consume some video and so forth. What I think is really important, um, and um, particularly given today's subject matter, uh, is is to to to, to really uh, uh, think about and keep in mind uh, keep business requirements very much at the forefront of industry thinking here. I think there there is a, still a terrific opportunity. Uh, the bet remains on to be able to sort of move the industry to a more of a sort of value-based pricing model. And you can see a whole bunch of the sort of standard examples you'd all be uh, sort of familiar with here. Um, but by putting sort of business ahead of the technology, we have this, this kind of opportunity to uh, create value for the customers. And we know actually that, that certainly in the enterprise sector, uh, there's very many enterprise sectors, customers there, where they see value, they are willing to actually pay for it. So we have the opportunity to... Um, not, not sort of um, revolutionize, revolutionize overnight, but actually you know, start to change and evolve uh, essentially the economic model of mobile. And I think that is something that, that, that needs to happen at this point. Um, one of the ways to deliver these types of services is um, you know, particularly where you're doing, dealing with something that's, that's sort of business critical or has some unique properties related to privacy or performance or, or, or such like, is through a network uh, slice. Now, this is a very big topic, I'm not going to go into it in, in, a, in a, a great detail here. Uh, but just to say, this shows, uh, this is the showing, this slide showing the results of a survey we carried out in association with Accedian uh, this autumn, uh, where we asked uh, operators, uh, 127 of them, as you can see, what is your company's timetable for deploying network slicing in its 5G core network at the following stages? Uh, and you can see the result pretty much shows it's going to be a, a phased introduction. Um, at the bottom line there, you can see within uh, two years, we expect, uh, well, we can see uh, a slight majority, 52%, uh, 56% say uh, they will have deployed uh, slicing on a sort of limited scale, I think we can, uh, in a limited way, so I think we can call it limited scale, limited sophistication. Uh, but, you know, uh, I very much expect to see that, and certainly the core network sensors asked about in the question within that period. Uh, and then as we go to a two to four year uh, outlook, you can see there we have um, a combined 79%, so 38% and 41% saying uh, uh, they will uh, offer or use network slicing for important customers and verticals. So um, you have there uh, basically a, a, a big majority. Uh, concomitant with this, I just wanted also to draw your attention to uh, the quote on the right-hand side of the chart from sort of... Um, from, from the Exceedian uh, CTO, as it happens, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a blog or paper he was, he was working on. Um, I think it's important. It's, it's nice that it comes in in an uh, event with Exceedians participating, uh, but also I think it really makes sense. I really like the, 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 the point it makes. It underlines the um, nature and importance of the change in service performance monitoring uh, in 5G. Uh, and you know, in, in 5G, we finally have the framework to define service level monitoring as opposed to network health monitoring. Um, I think that's one of the, 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 the really important and fundamental points. And with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Richard Exedian to take us through the next section. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gabriel, and uh, appreciate it. Yeah. Opening perspective there really sets up a framework for what I'd like to talk with um, with the audience about today. Um, I'm going to actually just start off by referencing something you just said. You talked about the economic mobile, excuse me, the economic model of mobile and the change that is afoot. I think that's a really important point, and I'd, I'd ask everyone to just think a little bit about uh, some of the history we've all gone through. So you commented around your experience of seeing LTE for the first time that it was a a uh, you know a uh, 
it was an oh wow moment. Um, and then, you know, perhaps a slightly more cautionary tale as you saw the same demonstrations uh, as we moved. I think your experience actually is uh, very indicative of what the general industry, all of us, uh, is dealing with. And, and what am I talking about here? So if you think about prior generations and, and um, you know, I'm going to make the massive oversimplification that is, uh, you know, perhaps riffed on by Saturday Night Live, but more G's is better, right? Uh, as we, you know, moved from 2G to 3G, uh, you know, there was some amazing things that you could just do for the first time. Um, but there were problems, right? So there were apparent problems even at a user level with the services that they were consuming on 3G networks. Now, many of the people on this bridge won't even know what a 3G network is, but LTE, for aka 4G or 4.5G, really provided an opportunity for equivalency to what most people experienced from a broadband uh, experience uh, in their fixed line. So whatever their most advanced uh, network-based experience was, whatever form it was delivered, there was always a gap in prior generations between what they would experience on mobile versus what they could experience somewhere else. And I won't bother defining where somewhere else is. Um, you know, my hypothesis is that that apparent problem from a user experience perspective uh, now, of course, all the caveats, you know, you're in a good 4G coverage area where somebody has spent enough money for capacity and coverage, et cetera. You don't have performance problems. You know, there's not really anything that you can't do on your mobile today, uh, you know, whether that's streaming, uh, you know, some level of gaming, et cetera. So the, the perceived problems with the service, which has people just accept that more technology is good because I'm experiencing a problem, doesn't really exist as we make the transition to 5G. And I think that's a really important uh, background to have in our minds. That economic model that you talked about, um, you know, in prior generations uh, would have been characterized by it's going to, the technology is going to solve a problem. So acceptance and enthusiasm uh, ensued. From uh, It's moved from that to now from a 5G perspective, it really has to evolve um, you know, it's going to provide a better value service for something I'm trying to do explicitly. And that value proposition needs to be backed up by guarantees. In order to guarantee those services, you referenced the quote from our CTO, Claude, um, we have to design into our infrastructure the idea of SLA management. I won't even make it as specific as performance management. It's SLA management of an end user's experience is going to be key to demonstrating uh, the value that we are asking end users, be they enterprises or consumers, uh, to give us in order to pay for the deployments of these, these technologies. Now, everything I just said, I think everybody knows intuitively, but as an industry, uh, and again, I'm a, I happen to be an electrical engineer. I love technology in every form. Uh, I get, I actually get really excited when I think about uh, advanced radio technologies, um, and my children frown at me when I try to explain it to them. I suspect that many of the people on this bridge uh, experience the same thing. All of us collectively have to step back and, and look at this from a business perspective, and that end user experience is the thing that's going to drive the dollars that our shareholders are looking for uh, from all of us. I'd like to tell you a little bit about how, you know, uh, I and Acedian uh, and the team feel uh, that how we feel that our paradigm for offering services and managing services needs to change. I also think, and this is perhaps a little bit provocative, that for the first time, our industry uh, has an opportunity with 5G to take back its right place at the top uh, of the cloud economy. And uh, I will talk more about that uh, as we get through this presentation, uh, and that explicitly goes to my lack of neutrality. Uh, I really want to put the current cloud kings on notice that the service providers around the world uh, who build the real networks that all these things run on, uh, you know, need to take their position uh, at the top of the stack. Uh, and I think we, with 5G, finally have the ability now to do so. 
Now, if I can figure out how to click the slides, we're going to be good. So we talked about all this, right? New services, uh, you know, personalized services, network slices. This is all good stuff. Uh, you know, we're going to reduce cost. Uh, you know, we're going to have automatic service provisioning. There's going to be machines hiding in the cloud somewhere that are going to make uh, services occur in a cost-effective and efficient uh, manner, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we talk about, you know, the evolution, you know, the new radios. You know, it's kind of the what I would call is the rule of tens. Um, you know, 10 times the bandwidth and then one-tenth of all the rest of the performance uh, parameters, right? So we all know about ultra-reliable, low-latency services. Oh, my gosh, that's a lot of words. Uh, we understand the idea that every single parameter that all of us as engineers and technologists have, have gotten used to in terms of the deployment of a network just got 10 times harder uh, in order to provide a 10 times better experience for whatever application is running on the network. That's all really important stuff. Right, and so when we go and we build uh, the real networks that users use, whether they're going to Silicon Valley to consume an app, they probably don't even realize that they're doing it because they don't actually do that. They go to a Amazon Web Services cloud server somewhere, but either way, it's running on real infrastructure that has to perform at a very, very advanced level. And in 5G, uh, the challenge of technology that the service providers, the people on this bridge, uh, experience um, is second to none. I would argue that the provision of cloud services, the provision of application services, uh, the provision of enterprise services at some level are all subsets, you know, of the complexity of the challenge that a service provider who builds a mobile network uh, faces every day, and in particular around 5G. However, uh, well, that's all very exciting, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, it's about the money. And the money is going to be directly tied to our ability as an industry to manage the end user's experience of something that they really value. And that ties to this, ability, this idea that performance management, <clears throat> if I can be more specific, is intrinsic to the service chain that we deploy. All right, so yesterday's challenge. Talked about this a little bit before. We get really excited about all the boxes and the connections and the latencies and the, and the speeds and the feeds and the details executing and the details of executing on uh, these network architectures. And that's all really important. It doesn't go away. However, the challenge has changed. Today, while we have to do that, it's necessary, but it's by far not sufficient. What's happening today, and you know, I have the unique opportunity of speaking to many of our uh, our service provider partners, and the challenges that they face today. So, you know, they have already most have already taken a perspective around service orientation when they think about managing their business. So, it's not just about connectivity, but it's, a, it's about connectivity tied to a particular set of applications that the service provider uh, sort of first step, first step that the service provider. Uh, hosts themselves. So, you know, various and sundry services, it's different for every uh, service provider depending on the assets that they, they have, but they host their own services and they want to manage those services and make sure that they're operating at a high quality level for their end users. But the problem is compounded by the fact that because folks, because consumers pay the service provider every month to access their entire digital universe, there is an expectation on the end user's basis, right or wrong, that the service provider is also responsible for their experience, app that the service provider has nothing to do with. So, you know, um, spent a lot of time talking to one of our largest customers. I'll leave the name out for the time being, uh, but they manage uh, mobile networks around the world. And their evolution uh, to a service-oriented um, service center uh, versus a knock as an example, which I'll talk about a little bit, is driven actually by WhatsApp at some level. It is the primary uh, problem for their customer care organizations. People have become dependent on that uh, application. They expect it to work perfectly all the time, and yet the service providers that actually provide, you know, access to their end users, they don't have anything to do with it. It doesn't matter the end user still calls in and says there's something wrong with your service. And so this challenge, this challenge of application experience, 
uh, is, bec is becoming an issue in today's networks, and it will definitely, definitely be core to the monetization effort as we move into 5G. All right, so what am I talking about? At, at some level, all of us uh, have dealt with, uh, you know, the idea of a, of a NOC, right? So a network operations center, and, you know, we all have visuals in our minds that are either, you know, based on real experience or watching TV, you know, you got a bunch of guys sitting in a room, uh, men and women, uh, experts all sitting in front of screens, and there's massive screens in front of them, and there's lots of flashing red lights all over the place. And essentially the model is, you know, if I build a network and the network is, consists of, a variety of boxes, as long as the lights, and I'm going to vastly oversimplify here, as long as the lights on all the boxes are green between the service and the end user, then the service must be good. Well, that's not good enough anymore. In fact, it probably never was. Uh, you know, we can have green across the entire network, particularly if you are looking at the network in any level of aggregation. If you don't have a high enough resolution performance management strategy, even your NOC infrastructure is not going to work right because you're going to be looking at aggregated KPIs, which I would argue uh, in a modern uh, network paradigm are useless. If you're not doing real time and if you're not doing high precision, then you're not really managing performance. Um, micro bursts, uh, you know, micro load situations uh, happen all the time consistently. And unless you're managing for those, you are constantly disappointing some subset of your customer base. The idea of the service operations center is very different. The primary focus of a SOC is to look at the main applications that are be being consumed by a certain grouping of customers. Now, uh, depending on the service provider, uh, they could be looking at um, applications like, you know, how's Facebook performing on my network, or how's Facebook performing in a particular region? Do I have a do I have a highly uh, a geolocated event that's occurring on Facebook that's overloading the caching servers that I've, I've used? Uh, is what's of of Spain as a consequence of a major football match? Um, you know, looking at what are the services that my uh, users are consuming, and how are they performing for, for various subsets. At some level, it could be at the entire network level. It can be drill downs to, um, you know, most of us have an experience that 20% of our subscribers account for 80% of our revenues, so we kind of want to look at how is their service experience performing, but really orienting our technical uh, resources, which are really the resources, be they human, or machine, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but those resources, both types, uh, need to be applied at the, the, the point of need or the highest point of need, which is typically impacts or service impacts for our highest revenue subscribers. That's, that's a very generalized view of a SOC. SOCs also, in my case, are multicolored. I'm just kidding. Uh, service operation centers also, uh, in some instances, can take into account a 360 degree perspective uh, of an end user, so really looking at their experiencing their experience of uh, billing systems, their experience of customer care systems, pricing and marketing value uh, uh, KPIs, et cetera, to develop a 360 de uh, degree view of the uh, user's experience of the service provider to net promoter score. I'm going to isolate um, the conversation to the technical side. In other words actual application performance for real users. Um, and then I'm going to leave out the more customer, you know, most of us are familiar with CEM systems. You know, a SOC that ties into systems inside of the service provider starts to look like a CEM system. As long as it stays in absolute real time and high resolution so that network events are being managed, uh, I'd argue that a CEM system can be a SOC, but it has to be real time. I'm going to isolate to the technical components of it. So what is it about the, the network that is affecting application experience to an end user? We've talked about all this. You know, ultimately, it needs to be a multi-layer view of customer quality of experience, uh, you know, their total end-to-end -end service, and then, of course, the attribute or the network components that are attributable to that particular experience. All right, so automating service quality. Um, 
it's a must with 5G. You know, I think I've explained that, you know, we, we don't have the advantage of, uh, you know, really, really crappy experience of a basic thing that somebody wants to do. That's what happened when we went from 3G to 4G. Um, you know, you really couldn't watch video uh, properly. There was no way you were going to do a, a VoIP call on 3G. It just would always be crappy. Uh, you know, there were some real fundamental problems with the service. Uh, as soon as people saw equivalency between what they were trying to do on mobile versus what they were doing in the fixed networks. We don't have that when we go to 5G anymore. People are, you know, 4G, 4.5G. I mean, you know, I can pretty much do on mobile everything that I do on my desktop. Um, and, uh, you know, so we really need to take a different approach. Quality management for specific use cases is intrinsic to the monetization opportunity in 5G. Just an example, uh, or a few examples. So we know today that uh, Netflix uh, is, you know, roughly 15% of total downstream traffic uh, on the entire Internet. Now, as an engineer, I get really excited thinking about, wow, uh, you know, what are the different ways that we can make that a, a really fantastic experience? The scary thing is, um, the expectation is that by 2023, video alone is going to account for about 73% of that mobile data traffic. And if we're not managing the experience of video at a very advanced level uh, today, uh, if we don't change, we're going to have an even bigger problem as we move forward. Another interesting dynamic that's happening across, you know, both fixed and um, mobile networks uh, is gaming. And I'm, now I'm going to have to make a confession here. I'm a gamer. I uh, have been for uh, oh my God, 30 years. Um, you know, I love it. I'm uh, not ashamed of it. Uh, and it does actually have real um, – it translates into – if you're a hardcore gamer, it translates into real technical challenges, and you will look for services – that uh, optimize your ability to be successful in that pursuit. I happen to play Fortnite. I am sure many of the people on this bridge have either play it uh, or their children play it. I do it because I like to hang out with my kids who like to do those kinds of things. Um, upwards of 14% of gaming traffic today is being generated by one gaming, one game, Fortnite. Why is this important? People will buy custom CPE. Okay, so there are custom routers uh, that are available for gamers to reduce um, their latency. And when you think about that, if somebody's willing to spend $300 to buy, you know, versus a $50 access point for their home, you have to imagine that a gamer who's running mobile gaming will pay 5 10 15 maybe even 20 extra dollars, excuse my North American uh, uh, reference here on a monthly basis to get the best possible network performance so when they hit fire they win you really have to think about the mindset of the end user when you think about all right how do we monetize here so in 5g we have an opportunity to capture you know a tremendous uh, value proposition um, for just a isolated component of the market which is mobile gamers uh, Translating that into, or some of these elements, into just some real-world real, real world examples, um, you know, Acedian is the world leader in Layer 2 uh, to Layer 4, active and passive uh, performance management. Um, you know, really, what does that boil down to? Uh, we help our service providers manage uh, their networks at the highest possible precision available in the, uh, in the industry. Um, we're talking uh, microsecond uh, resolution on performance parameters. Why is that important? Blah, blah, blah. Why is that important? Working with our service providers, we have found that packet loss, just as one example, so forget about latency for gamers and all that kind of stuff. That's another a whole other dissertation. Um, packet loss for video at very low levels, otherwise perceived as low levels of packet loss, you start to see artifacts. And any real-time high bandwidth service that starts to artifact, we've all had the VoIPing experience. In fact, I would be willing to bet, even on this conference bridge, people have had some experiences of where our voices just get drawn out or clipped. Um, in video, it takes very, very low, even at like, you know, 0.25% of packet loss across the network, um, an end user will, will perceive the service as being problematic. It's still usable, but it's problematic. 
the only point to this chart is just to is just to reinforce the idea that if you want to manage user experience, it's not something that you can do as an example of just looking at the KPIs that are being spit out by the routers in your network. Okay, those are aggregated, they're binned, they're non real time, and they don't correlate to end user experience. If anybody has any questions about that, we can we have loads of materials I'd love to share with you, but it is a, a primary challenge for our industry when we start to think about the idea that we have to manage the user experience. Uh, and then my favorite point, um, gamers uh, just don't, they, they just, they, if you if pack a loss of less than 0.5%, they're just like, you know, this isn't going to work. All right, so 5G network slicing. So we haven't really talked about network slicing other than, other than to mention it. Um, everybody on this bridge, I'm sure, knows what slicing actually is, but it's the first time that a mobile uh, uh, a mobile service provider has the opportunity to offer infrastructure as a service. Now, I am not suggesting that service providers, you know, go out and commoditize uh, their infrastructure and their value proposition to everybody and only offer network slices as an infrastructure service. There's all kinds of other things that you can do with slices uh, in terms of owning applications for certain groups of end users, whether that's like police, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, government entities, uh, whether that's for uh, specific uh, enterprises, et cetera. Um, but it is the first time that the technology itself allows for one resource allocation so that you can guarantee a particular service and then a service chaining methodology tied with performance management that lets you actually prove that you're meeting the SLA uh, in question. And so the insurance challenge of today, which I think of 5G as being a today uh, technology now, is uh, if you think about uh, slicing, which is probably the most complex use case, is really at a, its most basic level, the sum of the user experience in the slice. So you've got lots of users that are sitting inside of the slice and each of them are consuming some kind of service or application or they're doing something inside of the slice. And then there are a series of VNFs which make up the slice itself. The sum of those experiences, and I'm doing air quotes here in my office which nobody can see, the sum of those experiences, the users in the slice and then the VNFs that make up the slice, uh, is really the assurance challenge of, of today. All right, um, slightly uh, tangential, but important to understanding why, uh, I believe anyway, that service providers have a huge advantage over the cloud kings of today. So the cloud kings of today, by the way, if, you, if, uh, if that reference isn't obvious, it is the Amazon Web Services uh, of the world uh, you know, it's the uh, Web 2.0 companies. You know, these are the people that ultimately are considered uh, the kings of the cloud economy. Um, there are aspects of all of your networks, the service provider networks, that give you a unique advantage when coupled with the 5G network architecture to really take on those cloud kings. And I, and I want to I'm going to explore this in some level. So this was a uh, uh, heavy reading 5G performance monitoring survey that we did together uh, in Q3 of this year, and we asked the question, will the mobile edge cloud assets that you have deliver a competitive advantage or not? So the summary, you know, and we can we can drill into the individual uh, responses, but the summary is that over 70% of the operators that we canvassed uh, feel that the ownership of access and edge cloud assets, and cloud assets, you know, uh, I, I kind of get it a little bit, I really don't like the word cloud, well actually I love it, but it gets overused and, and underexplained. Um, you know, in this instance, what we're really talking about is the availability of compute assets as close to an end user or an application as you can get them. Okay, so when you think about optimizing experience and driving down so that you have, you know, latency and jitter and um, uh, you know other performance characteristics as best as they can be delivered uh, in uh, today's technology, uh, proximity is is really important. So let's think about the traditional. Uh, design of a mobile network, right? So while the cloud kings were building data centers in their basements and then they expanded them to warehouses and then they decided to locate them in Reykjavik for cooling uh, reasons, they have a very model of highly concentrated uh, compute resources. Now, yes, there are distributed data centers, uh, you know, available in all of them, but whatever their uh, 
definition of distribution is of compute network uh, resources. The service provider network will always be 10 times as more distributed. And that's because of the, uh, that's just because of the nature of running a mobile network. We all have uh, MITSOs, you know, mobile, mobile uh, switching centers, old MITSOs, right? That, you know, you know, what is a MITSO? It's power, it's air conditioning, it's racks, um, and it's compute. So the distribution of the edge of compute resources um, is most uh, optimized in, uh, in service providers, and that can be harnessed in 5G to offer a service, which I'm going to explain in a minute, that the current cloud kings just can't do. There's no economic way for them to get it done. Swiftly along. Sounds great. Can I get a SLA to go with that? So the idea being, you know, if we have these, uh, these uh, capabilities, how do we maximize and how do we capitalize on it? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. We're supposed to be going to a uh, online poll. So I've been talking a lot, um, saying some things about SLAs. I'm going to say a little bit more, but before we get into that, we're going to do a, a quick poll for the audience. I'm going to hand over to Gabriel to do that. Gabriel. Okay, good stuff. Uh, thanks, uh, Richard. So uh, as, as, as mentioned, we have an audience poll here, our first and only of the event. Uh, we'd like to get the opinion of everybody in the audience on the following question. Uh, which of the following will be your organization's most important enabler from driving new revenue from 5G? And I'll just place the emphasis on the new revenue there. And you can select one of the six options via the radio button, as you'd expect. Um, and we'll have a look at the results in a moment when everybody's had a chance to vote. While you're doing that, just a reminder, you can submit questions for Richard at any point uh, as we go through this. Um, so so, so uh, feel free to do that. Richard, while, while people are voting now, I have a, a quick question. Maybe you could uh, uh, discuss, and, uh, and, and if need be, we'll pick it up later. Um, when you talk about operators being top of the stack and um, uh, you know, hyperscalers being kind of cloud kings and so forth, I was curious if you had a view in, in terms of you know, how these parties kind of interact and, and work with each other. Is it, is it sort of a, you know, a race to the top of the pile and, 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 and stepping on the other's head, or is it more collaborative? What, what's, your, what's your feeling there? <laughs> well, I have a personal opinion, and then I have a, uh, uh, maybe an objective uh, view of what the outcome is. Right? So I'm going to give my personal opinion first. Um, you know, when I think about you know a, uh, a service provider who deploys a uh, 5G architecture that's capable of running slices, okay, if we use that as the starting point, um, I believe that the operator at that point has the ability to offer a service that cannot be matched by the current hyperscalers. Um, I'm going to explain that in a few minutes uh, when we get into uh, the remaining couple of charts. Um, they have an opportunity to really go ahead. The reality is, however, Gabriel, today, sorry, there's some audio uh, breakthrough there. I, I think that you know, as it, the the actual outcome will be a coopetition model where uh, certain <clears throat> certain service providers are going to start offering services. Um, you know, remote drivers as an example, uh, just as one examples for autonomous vehicles, which I can explore later. But um, there will be a few uh, examples of where service providers offer services that can't be met, met by the hyperscalers. And then that will trigger a set of negotiation between the hyperscalers and the service providers in order to do infrastructure as a service uh, as a co-opetition model. But we'll see. Yeah. OK, good stuff. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, we had the, the poll results out here. Thanks to everybody who voted. You can uh, see the results there, Richard. We have, um, I mean, the top two are high-speed consumer access, 24%, and the, the leads, actually, network as a service slice management, 27%. Um, uh, I guess that's kind of um, the result we sort of wanted to see there. Uh, given what we've been talking about. I must say, I'm, I'm a little surprised that, that the Network as a Service Life Management came out so high, um, you know, pleasantly. But, but what are your thoughts on this result here? Uh, personally, I think that's great. Uh, you know, you know I, I'm going to interpret that uh, kind of in a ba battle-hardened way. It seems to me that the uh, service providers in our audience want to go head-to-head, -head, and I think that's fantastic. 
Uh, and so uh, I'm going to spend the next five minutes explaining why, how I think we can do that. And then I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm issuing a rallying cry to our industry. Um, I want the service okay. providers to really, really go after this. And this survey result says to me uh, that the people in the audience uh, think that they can do it. And that's great. Okay, good stuff. I'm going to leave you to, to finish up until, until the Q&A now. All right. Excellent. So I'm going to go through these builds real quick. Because uh, you know, I want to I want to make sure we leave some time for the Q and A. So this this chart, the high stakes mobile cloud platform. So if I were to really abstract this at its highest level, this is how I uh, I perceive the opportunity uh, that 5G gives us as an industry. Okay. So if you will imagine, what did Amazon do for compute? Amazon basically uh, you know commoditized compute uh, with virtualization resources. Just apologize for that beeping. I don't know whose who's line it's coming from. Um, feels like it's uh, yeah, we're, not, not we're mine. Getting some break. Yeah, we're getting some breakthrough in there. Uh, I'm not sure if that's on, on your end. But anyway, um, so what Amazon did uh, to compute, I believe 5G will do to mobile, and very explicitly. If you look at what Amazon can do, now they have a very, very expensive, very small set of services that they offer for, you know, kind of like the Fortune 500 companies around the world, which are direct uh, wired connections, wire being a euphemism, wired connections to the data centers. But in general, Amazon will give you an SLA <clears throat> for the compute and networking resources that you access through the cloud or through the, uh, through the Internet. What they cannot do. What they cannot do is provide an SLA that goes right down to the end user device because it's abstracted either through the enterprise network or through the mobile network that the end user is using to access the service. So the SLA stops at the point of connect to the cloud resources uh, or the cloud infrastructure of Amazon. That's in stark contrast to what a mobile service provider can do. Mobile service providers can do everything that Amazon does today and then they can add to that the ability to guarantee a, a service level agreement all the way to the handset or all the way to the autonomous vehicle or all the way to the, you know, fill in the, uh, fill in the blank for the, uh, for the service uh, opportunity that exists. And that capability, right, that innovation, if you will, is a source of value that if capitalized on by the service provider community, I think provides the opportunity to at least put the current hyperscale cloud kings on notice and get them to the negotiating table around sharing the quote unquote wealth associated with the modern digital cloud economy. Performance to the edge, we talked about this a little bit. Edge is another one of those funny words. Um, edge, in my opinion, is everything except CPE, right? And again, if you think about, uh, you know, the multi-access edge for computing, which is really, you know, just a repurposed, uh, uh, you know, centralized BSC location uh, from our 2G and 3G network experiences, um, you know, the service providers, the mobile service providers will always have cloud uh, or edge compute uh, capabilities that are closer to end user loads. That's what enables those SLAs, as well as the idea that you have access, obviously, to the performance uh, of the radio access layer. Most demanding uh, scenarios. So, one more thought here, uh, and this relates a little bit to there was a recent article that came out just from Vodafone as an example, where they had went out and canvassed uh, their enterprise. Uh, uh, customers and uh, the ethical uh, use cases or the ethical use of AI uh, is the uh, and customer centricity is the primary concern of their enterprise customers. So quite interesting. It came out in uh, I think it was uh, 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 mobile uh, mobile live. Um, as we think about the deployment of the service chain for all of the things that we talked about earlier. Um, is, you know, if you, if you use as an example the 5G network slice, uh, we all know on this bridge how intensely complex that is and how much of a distributed architecture it is. The service chains, and this is just an hypothesis on Richard's part, you know, 
as we go to 6G, 7G, 8G, et cetera, effectively what's going to happen is that every individual user will have a dedicated network slice. That's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen in four years. But if you fast forward 10 years from now, every single one of our, our uh, of the services we consume will be a dedicated set of VNFs for us as an end user. That's how the service chain is going to go to its lowest level of definition and its highest level of complexity. And what does that mean? Well, that means ultimately, and this is a this is a, just a term, <clears throat> excuse me, that I used when I was speaking at a, a, a SDN NSV conference. The idea of an AI wrangler. So, you know, folks out there sometimes when I'm talking to them get really worried about the idea that people are going to be displaced by AIs. I, I don't see it that way at, I, at all. I think what's going to happen is our, our human assets, you know, will need to learn new skills around harnessing, you know, and I think of them as herds of customized and special, uh, specially defined AI and ML systems in order to manage the complexity that we are all going to experience in these networks. There is a much more uh, technical explanation of this uh, around closed loop automation and service chain optimization uh, that requires uh, orchestration and extremely granular uh, performance management. Um, but that I'm going to save for a different day. Is your network ready for 5G? Uh, you know, again, I'll just talk about this briefly. I said it at the beginning. Uh, we all, because we're technical, we're engineers, we get excited about the, the deployment of the real technology. Uh, speeds and feeds are really, really important. They are necessary, but they are far from sufficient. Um, when we think about the monetization challenge for 5G, and really when we think about the challenge of taking back our rightful place at the top of the cloud uh, economy, we need to orient around uh, a model around end user experience and SLA management. And, you know, I, I feel very strongly, I hope, hopefully, for some of the reasons that you've heard today, uh, the audience will, uh, will concur. And we absolutely welcome the opportunity at any time uh, to engage with you, uh, even, even just to exchange ideas around what this looks like. Um, uh, and I welcome I welcome folks uh, uh, to reach out, uh, uh, you know, at their discretion. Um, I, I'd love to engage in a conversation on any element of this. You know, mandatory one slide. You know, I don't want to talk about a CDN as a company, um, but we do have ideas on how to do everything that I've talked about. Um, uh, and if anyone's interested, I would, you know, again welcome uh, welcome any questions and engagement. So we're going to stop there uh, and uh, open it up for questions. And uh, Gabriel, you want to be the the uh, manager of the questions that we go after? Sure thing. Thanks, uh, Richard, and thanks to everybody who's written in to, to helpfully point out the the, the audio issues there. Um, so, first question um, is from a uh, from an operator in the United States. Um, by the way, don't read out any names or company names as we do these questions, so you can submit them in, in, in knowledge that it's sort of uh, anonymous in that, in that sense. Our uh, question here is, isn't the real point of network slicing to enable radical use cases? It really isn't a use case per se, but rather a way to apply policy-based software-defined networking to fulfill 5G use cases. So the real question is, how in your world do you do performance management on a policy-based SDN 5G use case. Uh, wow, that's a long a, one, that's but, a, a, but a long one, but a good one, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a heck of a question. So when you when you opened up the conference by saying that I was an expert, I'd actually like to say that whoever asked, asked that question is actually an expert. Um, joking aside, and and I do mean with that when I say that just based on that question, um, yes, slicing is not itself a service, although. Although, I would argue, so when I talked about putting the current cloud kings on notice, right now they treat uh, uh, operators as if the operator has no choice but to be the vehicle for their services. All right? I'm, I'm just speaking transparently. They trivialize the value proposition of the service provider because they believe that all service provider access networks are fungible and can be replaced. As a consequence, they don't negotiate uh, you know, uh, with any any level of perception that they're negotiating with uh, somebody that they need. With the 
you need to provide um, this, the infrastructure as a service as a slice owned as an example. So say Amazon goes to Vodafone and says, look, um, I want to rent slices in every single one of your markets because I need to offer, you know, you, you went and you scared me by offering to Uber the ability to have remote drivers uh, sitting in, uh, you know, containers, uh, probably a bad metaphor, uh, sitting in offices to, you know, when, you know, 5% of our fleet at any particular point in time of our autonomous fleet, so fast forward five years from now, they have an autonomous, Uber has an, an autonomous fleet, 5% um, of the time, those autonomous vehicles, by the way, autonomous vehicle means it doesn't need the network, just for the record, uh, but those autonomous vehicles are going to run into problems. And when they run into a problem, they're going to pull over. And then you have a situation where you've got a passenger in a car, and the car can't negotiate what's in front of it. The Uber will have to deploy remote drivers to take over in those, in those moments. In order to provide a service like that, you know, Uber can't turn to Amazon to do that. Amazon can't guarantee the kind of network latency that's required in order to have a remote driver take over a vehicle. Only a service provider. When Vodafone, I'm just using Vodafone as an example. When Vodafone first says, hey, I can do this for you, Uber, will be the moment that that hyperscale goes, oh, crap, and says, I need to negotiate with a service provider as a peer. That's where slicing as an opportunity itself matters. I would then say to the point of the questioner, yes, it really enables unique use cases that can be managed by the operator or sold as a infrastructure service by the operator. Yeah, yeah, okay, good one. Uh, just to close, we have um, maybe one or two more. I think this is a sort of standard question now for, for anyone involved in uh, analytics or performance monitoring service insurance. The question is, what is the role uh, for machine learning and AI in automating future networks? Um, appreciate that's hard to do in two minutes, but well, any, I mean, any I, thoughts I, on yeah, that end? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, one. You know, I'll just I'll just take a, a very Acedian specific um, perspective on this. So we've been building the, the highest resolution, lowest level of detail, uh, or highest level of detail, depending on which way you look at it, but the most, uh, the highest volume of PM. That, you know, are traditional, static, and hierarchical in nature. That's not good enough. Um, human speed, when you're managing service creation uh, at an instant, and if you're managing SLAs, uh, on an end user basis, there is no way that a human uh, control loop is going to operate uh, fast enough. Just full stop, it won't work. We built a big data system yeah. that has ML uh, number at, at its core because we and into orchestration, we will need ML to be looking for the problems uh, that exist in the sea of data that is the experience of all the users all the time. You won't do that at, at human speed. You will need to do that at machine speed. That is the most basic uh, application of ML uh, in, this, in this scenario. There are also yeah. uh, much, more, much more sophisticated use cases uh, around ML um, and uh, at some level AI uh, around looking for uh, optimized service creation chains. Um, but that's a more complex uh, discussion. Yeah, okay, just a, a quick follow-up. Just before I do, um, the people who have seen have pushed the audience survey out to your screens. Um, we'd appreciate it if you could fill that in uh, before you go. Uh, just to follow up that point, Richard, and to, and to close the call, um, the uh, data analytics and the, the um, ML work you're doing, is that, would you, you know, would, would, we, would I be right to associate that with sort of 5G and next gen, or what's the application kind of nearer term to LTE? I mean, there's, there's um, a lot wrong with LTE networks as well, I would say, in, in, in some cases. Yes, it is. It is uh, it's real. It's here today. Uh, we are, with our uh, service provider partners, using it as an example to optimize Volte experience in 4G. Um, and uh, happy to talk to folks about that. Uh, but, you know, when we think about, so, you know, I, when I put my strategy guy hat on, 
Uh, everything I talked about today and uh, the reference to 5G is actually related to our, our three-year strategy and our desire to be uh, a strategic partner for the service providers as they, uh, as they uh, put the hyperscales on notice. Okay, fantastic. With that, um, I'd like to close the call by first of all thanking uh, Richard from Exceedian. Thank you, Richard. Pleasure. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for attending and participating today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it and hope to see you again. Thank you and goodbye. Cheers, folks.